What's up YouTube, Mr. Lime SC here, and today we're going to be going over yet again another uh, Diablo 4 patch. So this is going to be, or not patch, uh, update. Diablo 4 quarterly update, so of course once per quarter they give us a nice update to the game. This is March 2022. I have not read any of this yet, per usual, so let's dive in. Hello and welcome to the first quarterly Diablo, uh, first Diablo 4 quarterly update of 2022. We hope you enjoyed last quarter's update on systems, itemization, and visual effects. That blog and our previous updates are available if you missed out. I'm struck by how much the game has evolved since our first blogs. It's difficult for these up updates to showcase all the work our engineers, designers, artists, QA team, and producers have done. How do you show a bug that doesn't happen anymore or explain how the planning in a burndown chart resulted in a feature making it into the game instead of getting cut? While you can't see those things, you can see how systems like itemization and skill trees have evolved, incorporating your feedback and internal testing along the way. You can also see how much closer we're getting to our artistic and thematic targets of dark, low fantasy gothic horror. And keep in mind the images you'll see today represent a work in progress. Many artists need to work together to, de to deliver Diablo 4 with top tier visual quality we can be proud of and the promise of an immersive world you can wander through and enjoy getting lost in. The seamless game you play is a composition of many layers of art and visualization from lighting to environments to props and interactives. Today we have artists from many of these layers here to talk about their craft and everything that goes into building the world of Sanctuary. We hope you enjoy this update and look forward to your thoughts and reactions. We have exciting things to share this year and we're grateful to have you with us on this journey. Thank you for playing the games you make, and without further ado, Artist. That's from Joe Shelley, Game Director. Art Director, Environments, Diablo 4, Chris Ryder. The team has been hard at work, and we're taking you behind the scenes on how we've developed the environments of Diablo 4. You'll hear from our Associate Art Director, Environments, Brian Fletcher, Associate Lighting Director, Ben Hutchings, Lead Exterior Environment Artist, Matt McDade, and Lead Props and Interactive Artist, Chaz Head. They'll be sharing how they approach either each of their distinct areas that ultimately come together to form the environment of Diablo 4. While many of the locations we'll be sharing are in various states of progress, this is an excellent opportunity to showcase the amazing work our teams are creating for the next installment of Diablo. The environments of Diablo 4 cover a lot of territory and visual real estate of the game, five distinct regions, and hundreds of dungeons that you will experience. It is where all the monster slaying, loot gathering, and exploration happens. Of course, none of this would be possible without the collective efforts of our talented designers, world builders, engineers, environmental artists, lighting artists, and technical artists. It's getting some shots along the way. We approach creating the environments of Diablo 4 through a darker and more grounded interpretation than earlier installments. The aim is for believability, not realism. Believability comes through our use of materials and deliberate construction of architecture and artifacts you will come across as you play through dungeons in the open world. In addition, regional weather conditions, varied local biomes, and a sense of history set the foundation of how an object or place should look visually in a medieval world like Sanctuary. After all, Sanctuary is full of history, struggle, and conflict, giving us many opportunities to depict a diverse world full of compelling locations in dark, gothic, medieval setting. Even the wealthiest areas in Sanctuary are challenging to exist in. Leaning into these characteristics adds to the richness of the world. It gives us a springboard to elaborate on the space visually, giving it a sense of identity we can lock onto and build around. The atmosphere is almost tangible in places with weather and lighting to with lighting play a more prominent visual role in Diablo 4. When it rains, surfaces get wet, puddles form in ruts, and hoof prints the ground feels muddy, the atmosphere is heady and heavy and damp. Contrast that by making your way into a hazy, firelit tavern that, inter that instantly contrasts with the atmosphere outside, a rare place of refuge and warmth. We want to take you on a journey, hinting at a location's past or recent events. The satisfying part of our work is developing and jamming on a location's unique visual story, pushing and pulling the art until it becomes an iconic backdrop for combat. Exploration finally screams Diablo. The easy warmth of a tavern welcomes you. Ooh, I like that. Town said an arid location. It's fun. Diablo 4's art is built with modern techniques and utilizes physically based lighting. As we handcraft locations across the eastern continent, we are mindful 
of the of our approach to support combat, navigation, narrative intent, and stylistic direction. To accomplish this, we filter concepts, locations, and final implementation through the dual pillars of Old Masters and A Return to Darkness. Using these pillars has been instrumental in keeping us con consistent and aligned with the visual tone of Diablo 4. The Old Masters pillar gives us a lens to filter our art through, considering the techniques classical painters like Rembrandt used with their controlled use of detail, tonal range, and expert use of color palettes. The Return to Darkness pillar is a through line in everything from dungeons to lighting and embodies the idea that Sanctuary is a dangerous and dark medieval gothic world. Additionally, we play to the iconic Diablo game camera, choosing where to add or remove detail to help the readability of the gameplay, space, or accentuate visual interest as needed. It is a balancing act that results in a handcrafted look with a distinct visual style that expands on the lineage of Diablo. It's kind of a cool look right there. It's exciting and inspiring to see the daily progress and hard work the environment art teams are creating. Let's jump into more specifics and hear from Brian, Ben, Matt, and Chaz on the six locations we feel illustrate our approach and the concepts we keep uh, of mind when building the environments of Diablo 4. The World of Sanctuary. I'm excited to talk about the open world of Diablo 4. We have five captivating zones to explore. Each region is fraught with dangers of their own kind, many routes and hidden corners to uncover. How you chose to make your way through the vast world is up to you. The art and design teams have constructed a contiguous world where you can roam from coast to coast or high up into the glacial ridges. For the environment art team, we want to ensure each handcrafted location is distinct and immersive. Looking through the Diablo 4 lens that Chris alluded to earlier, the environment art interacts and lighting team strive to hit the tone that supports the Return to Darkness pillar. The Skogs Glen Coast. This music's kind of dope. Water looks good. That's decent. I'd like to see more colors. Grass looked really good. For the Scottish and Coast environment, our team set out to tell the story of untamed wild shorelines and headland. Yeah, I mean, sometimes they go for darkness and it gets a little too muted, you know? It's like, give me some, uh, a little bit more spice in there. Make the water a little more blues. And, you know, it doesn't, I don't want D3 rainbow. But even when I look at, like, D2R versus D2 Legacy, you know, they kind of dim down a lot of good color in D2. In D2. Um, they had some really bright reds and really good stuff. And, yeah, a lot of things get desaturized. Is that a word? Too much. Too much desaturation. So even, you know, that when there's that blood red, it's still very, like, dark. Everything has so much dark, and it's like, get those accent really pops. But not like a, you know, a silly color, right? But, yeah, it's kind of like when you go to the River of Flame, and then you get all the orange and everything in there, and it's, whoo, and there's just a lot of really gorgeous color. Um, yeah. Dark doesn't mean no color, just means not cartoon, exactly. Uh, tell a story of untamed wild shorelines and headlands. As you transition towards the shore from the inland, the coastal biome is first evidenced by the longer, more directional grasses that react to the drifting offshore winds. I mean, the grass and the wind was beautiful. The beaches are bleak and littered with seaweed, kelp, and rotting carcasses. Rugged cliff tops ascend uh, whilst promontories are carved by continual pounding of waves below the through the process of creating our biomes the environment art team has set out to communicate that this coastline is rife with peril 
For the main settlements along the coast, it's important to us that they feel woven deep into the fabric of the coastline. Dwellings with deep-rooted foundations skirt the clifftops in futile attempts to withstand the harsh elements. These structures are comprised of whatever materials the locals could lay their hands on and in various forms of disrepair. Stone walls, savage woods, and thatch for roofs. A place of consolation for the brave fishermen that trawl these treacherous seas. Fishing plays a significant part of the day-to-day -day life in these weary locals, so we latched onto the idea and placed emphasis on these villages being centered around fishing. That's cool. By adding supportive elements like rudimentary docks and slipways, it really helps set the stage for interactive teams to come in and layer on their culture kit throughout the area. Many of the props are dynamic, the ships swing in the ocean waves, the fishmongers nets hanging to dry in the marketplace. Our main purpose here is to breathe life into the awesome architecture and terrain work. Our props and culture kits help provide that tangible real world scale that Diablo world represents. The drowned culture kit here is all interactable or breakable. When we set up these props, we push ourselves in terms of destruction. We want a constraint system to hinge specific pieces together. This allows us to orchestrate uh, distinct, realistic, and variable types of destruction. We do our best to th tell the story of what has happened here. The drowning dredged, dredging with them, hoard from beneath the sea, littering their conquests with relics of long-lost cultures as they raid across the beaches of Sanctuary. As you explore... Diablo 4's open world, you'll experience a lot of variation in the lighting and weather. Here in the skies and close, you can see the foggy, frigid atmosphere taking cues from highlands and moors. Across the game, we're striving for a grounded and natural palette, allowing us to create visual space and gameplay uh, that also achieves a gritty tone suiting the world of Sanctuary. The Orbe Monastery. Okay, going for that act two look. Gold pickup confirmed. Still a little muted. I liked the, you know, I liked the look a lot of it, though. I did have a little bit of a, yeah, a little Breaking Bad filter going on, it felt like. Uh, the Orbrine Monastery is an isolated and secretive feature in rural dry steppes. While the Zacharim's presence has diminished, the monastery carries evidence that the places, places of worship for the Zacharim can still quietly function. Since the location here is in the desiccated plains of the dry steppes, we aim to push the notion of dusty grasslands with sparse vegetation. We've made the conscious decision to add dark rocks that complement the pale blonde and rusty grasses. Pop poplar and sexual trees cling to the ground, which really helps them provide parallax movement on screen. This con contributes to the greater depth as elements in the foreground move quicker than those further in the back, back in the scene. I mean, I did think it. this area was, was prettier to me. To help provide extra visual interest in the region, the environment art team created a salt's flat biome, being able to have blue alkaline lakes skirted with salt encrusted tufas, tufas, and vivid geothermal pools really helps add pockets of vibrancy to the dry steps and create compelling natural landmarks. Against the efforts of the Zacharim worshippers, and like many of the buildings in Sanctuary, the Orbe Monastery is a state of, in a state of dilapidation. A goal of ours was to visually communicate that whilst this place is in the early stages of ruins, it once was a prominent base of learning for the Zacharim monks. Compared to the native architecture in the dry steppes, the Zacharim architecture is more distinct and refined. These structures are adorned with ornate details and often accompanied by elaborate statuary. 
Chaz will elaborate more on the interesting relics that can be found on the Zakram estates. Many followers of Zakram come to pilgrimage in Orbe Monastery. Caravans along the road reinforce this idea. Making these wagons explode is always a fun time. As you can see, it has fallen on hard times. Much of the storage and keepsakes of the Zakram have been laid to waste. You can pick through the ruins of the abandoned monastery. Perhaps there are still treasures to find. As you venture outside the monastery into geothermal region, many of its natural inhabitants to contend with. If you look closely, you'll find the dwellings among cliffs. Next up, we have Kio Vashad. So dusty. Ash, yeah. Snow, ash, dust. The verticality of the maps is really cool. Our goal with Kai Shad is to really drive home the idea that this medieval settlement feels oppressive, frigid, and harsh. However, we still need to convey that this is a place of refuge afforded to those that who reside within its boundaries. This is a militaristic settlement, so it's important that we give it a heavily defended presence straight off the bat. It does have that. We believe it appropriate to provide a gradual buildup of smaller defense structures upon approach to the settlement. Doing this hints to you that something greater lies ahead. Upon reaching the gates, you're confronted with steep stone, perimeter walls, and a deep cavernous moat that wards off any unwelcoming visitors. Upon entering the town, you see the architecture typical through the fractured peaks. Making use of the wood from the many forests in the region, structures here are clad with natural pine boards and burnt shingles. As with most dwellings in sanctuary, these buildings are very much function over form. In the video, we can see a large portion of the southern end of Kayoshad, which contains the simplest of shelters, some clinging to the town walls overlooking the glacial flow beneath. When you happen upon this area, we want you to draw similarities with slum-type encampments where densely packed living quarters are in abundance. The Inactive's team has done a fantastic job of really driving home that narrative with their culture pass. Kayoshad has many districts, each one dressed in unique culture kits, here we have the slums with the downtrodden seek shelter from the extreme elements. We support this idea by layering details of frayed clothes, broken sh frayed cloth, broken shelters, and general unhappiness. Can you believe this is an example of high-end living and sanctuary? For this nightmare, look at the Kayo Shad. We can use the fog, soft shadows, and bounce lighting to create a softness to the lighting. This softness is a core part of Diablo 4's lighting aesthetic, providing a natural and grounded frame. We aim to give Kayo, Kayo Vashad a thick and lived-in atmosphere where warm and earthy tones giving a sense of reprieve from the fractured peaks, peaks cooler frigid palette. Dungeons that are still randomized content that you know and love uh, from previous Diablo titles. However, we add new and exciting features that allow us to make even more dungeons across the world of Sanctuary than ever before. In order to support over 150 dungeon, dungeons, we have had to shift the way we make the environment art so that it's flexible enough to be used in multiple locations and not just in a single dungeon. We break it down to what we call tile sets. We would like to share with you a handful of our tile, tile sets and a few ways we can mix and match them with props, interactives, and lighting to create dungeons that are varied, handcrafted, and yet procedurally created. It takes a lot of hard work for many teams to make a dungeon. We're proud to show you what we have been working on. Let's see the dungeon. I really do agree about the verticality of these maps. I mean, this dungeon's like layout is super cool. And seeing down to stairs below and things like that really does have a really good feel there.
Now, yeah, it does a little bit have the D3 map skinny pathway style there, and I hope that that's not something that is always uh, going to be in every dungeon as such, you know. Tell us an example of how we have returned to darkness. We want you to take... We want to take you deep underground to the darkest recess, recesses of Sanctuary, where a mysterious and gross corruption has taken root. The ancient temple is a great place to push some primal horror vibes. The fixed camera is one of our best tools since it allows us to place assets in the foreground without blocking the play, playable space. Because we always know where you're looking, we can dial in and customize the layouts, vistas, and foreground elements to make sure there's a good composition. The spider legs are placed in specific locations for their unnerving silhouettes twitching in the background. Our dungeon design counterparts give us some great layouts to play with, which allow us to push the depths of each scene. We want you to have the impression of that the dungeon goes on forever, and you're only seeing a small part of the large underground labyrinth. The props interactive team seek to maintain the mystique and horror settings Brian described. Our hope for this culture is to make you feel uneasy whilst being rewarded for venturing forward. Nothing here should feel like it was crafted in sanctuary by the people living on the surface. We are able to focus on the different styles of shape, language, monolithic, and twisted. This is not a place you would want to explore alone. Here you can really see our embrace of Diablo Force core pillar of Return to Darkness. Our aim is to subtly lead you through the dungeon whilst revealing fantastically gross forms. In dungeons like this, we focus a lot on silhouetting and the player space and giving a scene, uh, the scene a sense of scale and depth. This helps navigation and visibility, but also shows the vastness of the environment. Wretched Caves. Very green, yeah. I like the, the music they've played in these so far a lot. The world of Diablo 4 is incredibly large, utilizing numerous uh, unique tile sets to cover all the various zones, biomes, and cultures. In order to create so much high quality content, we found clever ways to reuse our tile sets and add enough variety to cover 150 plus dungeons, all while providing fresh experiences each time. One way we can do that is by dressing up tile sets with various themes. This next dungeon is a hidden druid resting site overrun with demons. As you travel through the dungeon, you'll see that it's covered in many druid, druidic cultural items such as talismans and charms. We place a lot of these items on a layer that can be turned on or off depending on what the theme of the dungeon is. In one dungeon, it's a druid burial site, in another, it's an uninhabited dark cave. Adding these sorts of details is a great way to add a lot of visual interest as well as visual storytelling. These assets were made by several teams, so this is a great example of many groups coming together to contribute to a final environment. We're able to expand the druid culture kit in this dungeon. In many ways, the druid is an exciting return to the Diablo franchise, no less for props and interactive. Expanding on this unique class by providing full kit for its reclusive people, it would be easy to make the druid's prop fantastic. But we stretch ourselves to come up with fun ways to keep the culture kit grounded while not turning the druids into something they are not. I hope when you play Diablo 4, you get a sense of their magic while not betraying the dark and gritty world the druids reside in. Flooded Depths. Secret. Just key text. Oh, okay. So we can cross ropes. And yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of interactive stuff with all that. Very cool. I'm 
totally cool with that. Yeah. New dungeons features such as seamless floor transitions or traversals are exciting, but my favorite new feature is what we call tile set transition scenes. These are scenes that allow us to connect two different tile sets together in the same dungeon. Imagine running through a crypt, only find a hole in the wall that seamlessly leads you to a deeper, into a vast underground cave network, all while keeping the randomized layout set change with each, each dungeon run. In this final video, we show two tile sets joined together by a tile set transition scene. The first floor of this ruined uh, keep remains dry and fairly intact, but as you journey deeper into the dungeon, you'll discover that the lower levels have decayed from endless floodwaters pouring in. This swampy ruin is perfect for the drowned to move in and fortify themselves deep below. You have to fight your way through their defenses and climb across the rope to transition deeper into the flooded ruin tile set. I love this dungeon. It was one of our first where we died in the style for props and interactives in Diablo 4. On the surface, we have a definitive gothic medieval style fans love. Pikes, suits of armor, and iron chandeliers. I hope this set reminds you of what Diablo means to so many of us. Part of that is the vision... Uh, part of that vision is the sense of danger of exploration. As you dig deeper, things get gritty. As you descend, you will encounter obstacles seemingly out of place. The drowned have invaded this ancient manor and dragged their obscene valuables across the floor. This gives us the opportunity to mix, mix kits, and I hope you agree. The mold and crusted assets are gross. Things should feel familiar but taint by the sodden hands of the drowned hordes. Exciting to be able to merge two distinct visual styles. Here we see the dark foreboding hallways that keep lead down to the putrid awkward tones of its depths. In both, we can see the same approach to lighting these dungeons with different executions. The keep has a very oppressive, dark, very selective lighting scheme, hinting at pathways through the corridor steadily with soft lighting. By contrast, the flooded depths use putrid green and yellow tones to really give the dungeon the feel of damp, heavy atmosphere. I like that red. It's the brightest color we've seen. Cow level. That looks cool in there. That was a quick overview of how we approach the environment of art of Diablo 4. We love creating the stage for all the action while still delivering subtle visual cues that make Diablo games so iconic. Lastly, it's not too often that we get to share and appreciate the incredible work of our teammates and the progress of Diablo 4. We're glad you stopped by for a look and hope you're excited by what you see. Thank you for joining us and keep an eye out for our upcoming blog, blog update next quarter. Make sure to follow Mr. MrLamaSC at twitch.tv slash MrLamaSC and to subscribe to his YouTube. Wow, that's so sweet of them. Signed, the Diablo 4 developer team. That's very kind of them to say that. Throw that in there at the end. Uh, yeah, I mean, it looks 
it looks pretty solid. Again, my, my main complaint is the muted piece of it, right? It, it still has a little bit of that muted stuff. If I go back to Legacy Diablo, um, you know, I mean, even right here you get, you know, but I, I really just look at a lot of the, the colors that we do get. And obviously, you know, we kind of have some, some mute in here, but it, it's not even quite as muted you know, when you really get to to the colors that you have in Diablo 2. Yeah, and maybe it's just the fog. There's a lot of fog. Yeah, it's... And, and a little bit monochromatic, maybe. Um, you know, is, is potentially a thought. It, it feels like a lot of stuff does kind of blend as opposed to really having some stark... Uh, colors to kind of contrast and stuff like here you can see this color scheme is you know still dark and it still feels dark but it doesn't kind of so much blend together that you lose distinction of pieces a little bit you know right and so even even if the color schemes, you know, are, are a little bit here and there. And then, of course, you've got, you know, ones like the River of Flame where it pops out. And now you've got this, you know, you've got these bright oranges and reds in here and stuff. And it's gorgeous. And, you know, if you go around the city, you've got, you know, plenty of... I mean, look how hellish this all looks, you know. So you've got darkness, tons of darkness out here. But still a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of that. And, you know, and I mean, even when you go out into here again, you, you have you have these colors that still do have a lot of that similar color uh, style. But, you know, and I'm really just looking at the colors here. But there's still a lot of difference between the wall and the ground and all of this and I feel I feel a little bit that does maybe get lost just slightly yeah just a little bit more contrast now that being said uh, I thought you know a lot of these areas did look really beautiful you know there's plenty of areas in here that look really good this one, you know, like this looks amazing and stuff, right? This is probably one of the best, most contrasted areas. But I did feel like some of these dungeons and some of these things were a little bit, had a little bit of contrast work to be done. But very cool. Very cool everything uh, that they're doing right there. Obviously, I, I you know, I'm always with the simple idea of doesn't matter if the game's not good, right? So I'm always like, show me more about the mechanics and the items and the gameplay and all of this stuff. But at the same time, how a game looks, how a game sounds is very important still, right? Like you want to have a good base game, but all of the pieces on top, you really want to have good quality in there as well. Um and so, you know, so I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm hopeful that this is going to be, uh, you know, just a beautiful game and that the gameplay will follow. And it'll it'll also be uh, beautiful there as well and super fun. And we can all move into it and have a good time and get thousands of hours out of that as well. Um, yeah. So we'll see. We'll see. The music, the sounds, the audio was very good in, in this as well from what I saw. They didn't really talk about it here at all. They were talking about the visuals. But the audio pieces to go along with it, uh, you know, there were some chills a little bit when we were walking around uh, in a few of those places. So, you know, that's that's good. That's what you definitely want to have is a little bit of a little creepiness and a little bit of the chills there. Um, yeah. So I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on uh how it is how you think uh it will be there what you liked or didn't like about it right here maybe you're like no i like the fog darkness that they kind of have going in there and that plays even better into it you know that's we all can have different opinions on it regardless go ahead and leave your comments down below don't forget to like and subscribe appreciate you guys being here peace youtube
I'll see you guys next time.